Hello. Hello. Uh, how are you doing? Not bad. I was going to say, yeah, a minute earlier, but it's you, Nigel. I thought it was someone else. <laughs> how are you doing, guys? Yeah, good, thanks. Get, you're you? looking smart there. <laughs> Playing the guitar. This is the guitar. Oh. <laughs> Let's start spamming people with a link, shall we? Managed to get a good attending list to that tonight. Yeah, we'll see. Randy Faye's on the list. Oh, cool. Well, we are recording, so uh, no one say anything mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of Randy Faye. No problem. I'm a big fan of DJ. Yeah. It just works. And I like the snapshot feature. Does um does Docs all have a snapshot feature? You muted, David. That or you mind me? Semi. <laughs> what do you mean by it, semi? It it has it can snapshot databases, um, but it doesn't snapshot anything else. So things like if you've got settings for any other services, you can't snapshot those. Um, which most of the time isn't an issue because if you've done customization it will usually be in a file but occasionally it can be an issue particularly if you've got redis cool. well dda snapshot does everything so mm. which i quite like especially since i've been tasked with upgrading stuff to d9 so uh, oh, i broke the site i've unbroken it how are we doing Hello, Paul. Are you ready? Are you nervous? <laughs> I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> Not really. um, have we got the correct meeting ID on Meetup? Because somebody posted one in the DDEV uh, thread earlier on, which I think might be different. Are they trying to hijack our... Well, I don't know, but I think not to just... Let, let, let me put it this way. I linked here through Meetup. Right, okay, that's yeah. good. Uh, so let me just things. check the link that was posted in DDEV earlier then, uh, on Slack. Reach that horrible time of year again where the sun is right in my eyes right at the moment. Yeah, I get that. Now, okay. Actually, both of those were meetup links rather than the meetup ID. Ah, uh, the one that went, yeah, the one that went with the I've accepted yeah was a meetup.com link right which okay. is All why right. i went to meetup.com to get the zoom link okay well we should be okay then um good um i've just got a, a, a slide to finish off do you mind if i just um go on mute for a little for a couple yeah. of minutes just to finish off and then uh oh this is only uh, meet and greet in it so you've got like 25 minutes yeah absolutely yeah well, I'm, I'm literally nearly done but um I'll just well, no pressure, Paul. In fact, I'll turn the volume down because I'm, if I'm not distracted, I'll do it quicker. So, uh, radio silence. Bye for a moment. I'm sure we can entertain ourselves for 20 minutes. So, what's everybody being up for then? Anything fun? Then I'll jump in at once. Mostly working, as you know. Yeah, I know, David. <laughs> <laughs> I hate payments. <laughs> what have you been working on? Is it payment gateway stuff? Yeah. Um, uh, basically a load of um, SPA2 stuff, so the secure payments authentication stuff. Uh, 
and unfortunately the documentation we have for the uh, payment gateway is from 2012 so 3d secure was not a thing then not sure it's a thing now is on clients well yeah, I, think, uh, I want to live in the past why do we have to update anything so I said the Drupal 6 client, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't, I just wouldn't put up with that. It's Drupal 9 now, or else get out. Yeah, actually I don't even know, well, I suppose you could in theory run Drupal 6 in Docker because you could even if you had to compile it yourself, you could do a Docker image for um, 5.3. I think DDEV actually supports 5.3 or someone did a tutorial on it. DDEV supports uh, 5.6, but Drupal 6 is fine with 5.6. Oh, is that okay. there's, a, there's a recipe for going back to old PHP and DDEV Contrib. I've tried it back to uh, 4.7. Drupal 4.7. Always wanted to get to one of your meetings, and here's my chance. <laughs> Great to see you. Great to wow. see you all. We don't like to spam so much. Maybe that's the key. We've got to try and beat Phil's attendance. He gets like 15 people. I'm sure he bribes him to attend. <laughs> it's Drupal yep. Yorkshire. They've not got the money for bribery. It all goes on tea. And warm beer. All right, once they have had a drink, everyone's very generous. Now they are. <clears throat> so yeah, I've been doing uh, upgrades myself. So I'm now trying to break Pattern Lab because apparently it doesn't work very well with D9. Oh, so that's, big that's, that's the new thing. It's twig two that's the problem. Yeah, it's not breaking for me yet, so we'll see. Well, was it was it you or was it Christopher that found composer aliases did an awful lot of good stuff for yeah. faking getting Drupal <laughs> working? Uh, it just it adds a module fallback, doesn't it? Like, yeah, you can tell it that. D9 is D8, so it thinks that it's running D8 rather than D9, and then you'll get less complaints about stuff. And yeah, I've just done another one today, so we're going to have another one going live next week on Drupal 9. Lovely. I think more time gets spent testing these than actually doing the upgrades. Oh, we'll start, start banging out a blog entry every time we do one. They'll see 10 or 11 in a few weeks, and uh, everyone will realise it isn't actually as scary as they thought it was going to be. Well, we're doing an easy one now, and we've done a non-pattern lab one. So after this, we should be ready for one of the scary ones. So if we manage to do one after this, like, not going to mention any names for recording, but some of them are quite complicated. Yep. Are you uh, looking forward to moving on to greener pastures, David? And Phil, I should guess, eh? But I guess you've started now, haven't you, Phil? Yeah, I started now. Working again. <laughs> Back to the grind. Thing. Are you still doing the same kind of thing? Uh, lots of reading and investigation this week because uh, sort of new new practice and stuff. So getting my head around uh, a different company or agency setup. Oh. Yeah, first slow, few basically. weeks and never first few weeks at a new place are never easy. <laughs> Hello, Karen. Hi, Karen. Mine's not bad. I, uh, I went to um, the Drupal Chicago meetup and they had like 32 people. There's more people in Chicago though. 
Yeah, there, there were a bunch of Europeans there. There were Kola, who comes from most of the um, Manchester ones. He was there. And he's in Germany, I think. Mm. They're so what, six hours behind in Chicago? Yeah, something like that. It was at 2 a.m. well, 4 a.m. Yeah, so yeah, that, that'd be 8 till 10, so that'd be about right for a meetup. I think Germany, Germany's an hour later, isn't it? So it'd be yeah. 3, 3, 3, 3, 3 till 5. five for him. Now that's hardcore. Yeah. That's that, that time at DrupalCon, that is. Oh, missing a few people, aren't we? Oliver being one of them. At least doing the later talk, so I ah, suspect. Fair enough. That's yeah. That's not quite so bad then. I suspect it's a child's issue thing. Yeah, it could well be. <clears throat> Oh, there he is. Does anyone have any news that they'd like to talk about, announce anything before we get started? Don't think so. There wasn't even any security announcements last night. Yeah, I know. It's kind of irritating isn't it just like i always take it easy on wednesday because i know the security updates is coming out and the clients are like yeah security updates <laughs> fool you this week yeah and then when they said there's no updates i'm like ah oh, i've got to work anyway now because i didn't work earlier So has anyone done any more upgrading to Drupal 9? No one else braving it? Hashprint code's on the way. A couple of modules give me tr trouble, but uh, nothing too bad. I might do, I'm waiting on two. <laughs> Fucking nudge there. Uh, there's enough sites in support you could do some. Sabotage all the D7 sites. That's what I need. Oh, there's one I can sabotage for you very easily. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying At to find least... the payment gateway. <laughs> that seems to do it. At least yours will be in a decent condition, though, won't it? Like some of the inherited projects that they don't want to spend money on are just like I don't know walking corpses yeah yeah the, the 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 thing with my main one is it's it's complicated and it's not drupal is basically being used as a glorified front end it could it, it would be better off using something like gatsby um because we're we're dealing purely with an api we're not really using drupal seems bizarre well, when it was built, well, I've been with Anatech three years now, um, and it was about a four-year-old project then and still hadn't been completed. 
so um you know sort of eight ish years ago seven eight years ago gatsby wasn't a thing decoupled wasn't really a thing it was only just sort of on the edge of everything back in the room uh, randy welcome whereabouts are you based randy Thank you. Yeah, I'm in uh, Palisade, Colorado, in far, far western Colorado. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Mountains and skiing. It's not so fantastic right now. We have fires in our area, and uh, one of the biggest fires in Colorado history is burning about 20 miles from here, and it's been filling the air with smoke and ash and all kinds of things. So uh, we're having to change all our plans. Most of the major highways are closed. At least the ones that we wanted to use. I was supposed to be leaving on vacation today. That's, uh, that's uh, a shame. Normally it's all good. This is a, the background here is the cliffs, cliffs right. Uh, I could I could show you out our window if I was pointed the right direction. Just uh, just a couple of miles away from here. That sounds great. I've always wanted to go to Colorado. Anyway, yeah, thanks I'm for joining us this evening. Anyway, you you felt oh, I don't know whether you know, but. Um, because you'll deal with so many people, but um, over the months you've dug me out of, uh, over the years, should I say, you've dug me out of many holes. Um, <laughs> start, starting with those um, uh, videos that you made for commerce guys at about the time they launched oh, their commerce. That was, that was the day, huh? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, always been very, very helpful, a lot of time for people. I've been doing some, some Dito. Uh, videos recently people always appreciated you know people sometimes still ask somebody asked me the other day hey can you help me with this commerce thing i can't figure it out i know <laughs> and I'm like oh i don't know <laughs> well, that's not uncommon with commerce <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, I, uh, do we have many more arrivals um uh, i think we were signed up for a about 11 or 12, weren't they? It might have been, but I just spammed the link everywhere, so I'm not bothered. I'll, I'll quite happily ban people from chat. <laughs> well, we, we probably should make a start because we've got quite a bit to go through uh, tonight anyway. Um, our guest speaker this evening is Oliver Davis again, um, who's going to be doing... Uh, a presentation that he's done at a few different meetups and conferences about Tailwind uh, CSS. You might recall two or three meetings ago, I asked um, um, Oliver about Tailwind and he gave us a little bit of an introduction, but tonight's his, um, his full presentation on that, which um, uh, certainly I'll be very interested in. Does anybody have any news or announcements at all? I already asked that. Yeah, we'll right. talk about that. There, there is nothing currently. <laughs> There's no security of this, there's a couple of modular releases, there's nothing yet. Right, okay. Uh, well, just briefly, I mean, not necessarily for now, but maybe after the presentations, if anybody's hanging around, uh, I thought it was probably time to raise the subject about whether or how people felt about maybe starting up some meetups in person again sometime soon. Um, life does seem to be getting back to normal one way or another. Um, Although I think the Zoom things worked out very, very well. Um, it, it's, it's increased participation in some respects. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's good for accessibility for people that don't want to meet up. So um, maybe, maybe we can have that conversation uh, later on. Um, I've been tinkering with uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, did somebody just spit then? <laughs> <What was that? laughs> Sound effects. <laughs> Probably my creaky chair. Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't have turned that better. Notice you <laughs> mentioned Windows and Randy disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the reason Randy's here, actually. Uh, um, but, uh, but anyway, um, so this isn't a um, uh, particularly... Uh, high level thing. I've only dabbled with it um, for a couple of different reasons, which I'll explain. And um, 
anyway, maybe it's just something a little bit different for your normal sort of Drupal uh, meetup type thing. So I'll just move my screens over there. And Dan, if, uh, if you can let me share my screen and um, confirm that we've got the correct monitor. Are you seeing a slide deck here? Yep. Okay, uh, let's just go to present mode. And I'm on Windows tonight for some reason, and it's running very slowly, I have to say. Here we go. Oh, with Zoom, it's running slowly. I don't know whether that's just, um, uh, sorry, with Google Docs, it's running slowly. I think that might be a more of a Google problem because we've be. had problems with it the last couple of days. Have you? Right. Okay. Um, so you know, got Google a... uh, is actually having outages right now. So your yeah. slides, I hope the local as well as remote. Um, I think so. I think so. Let's, <laughs> let's hope so. Um, so, um, using Windows Subsystem 2 with PDEV on obviously a Windows 10 PC, my first impressions. I haven't done a massive amount with it. It was really just a matter of testing. I haven't actually spent time um, uh, building any full sites with it. Um, more a question of, you know, out of curiosity, having a look at it and seeing how it works and playing around with it um, for, you know, a day or two on and off. So, um, why bother? Why did I do it? Well, I normally work with the MacBook Pro and sort of over the years, um, I've used MAMP Pro most of the time, which has always worked pretty well for me. Um, but I also use, I also need access to decent graphics and photography software. I, I do a bit of amateur photography, but more to the point, I do it for work. I do, I do website photography because um, I'm not particularly, uh, don't regard myself as a great designer or illustrator. So I, I sell websites by how they look with great photographs rather than how they look at, how they look with the, the expertise of a graphic designer being involved. Um, I like to use my, my office setup at home. I like to use three monitors. Find that works well for me. Makes me very productive. And with three monitors, you don't really get neck ache, which you can do with, um, you know, more monitors. Or and it, it's better than having two monitors where it's you, you, your field of view is kind of split down the middle by the uh, the frame of each monitor side by side. Um, I need to use decent software for the graphics. Um, I have been signed up for Adobe Creative Cloud in the past, but you know, being self-employed, independent, one-man band, it's quite an overhead and I don't need access to it every month. So I don't subscribe to it anymore. Uh, I do use Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo, which are both very good alternatives coming in at a low cost. And, but I do sign up for the Adobe Photography Package, which gives me access to Lightroom, which I use all the time. And also Photoshop, which I never use. Um, I don't know whether you've ever tried sticking three monitors on a MacBook Pro. You've got to, uh, my, my MacBook Pro is a little bit older. It's a two, two, 2013 model. Um, so I've got two uh, Thunderbolt outputs and I've got a HDMI output. And if you use all three of those, you can plug three external monitors into a MacBook Pro. And uh, there's no problem with the graphics quality. Everything looks fine. Um, and most of the time it kind of works out all, all right. But as you see, what, 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 what you do find is that they tend to run hot when you're doing that. And actually my first MacBook Pro, the graphics card burned out completely. Um, catastrophic failure the the uh, the graphics card on a macbook pro is soldered to the motherboard so uh, all i got for what was originally i i bought it second hand but it was originally a 2700 pound laptop i bought it second hand for 1700 pounds and i eventually had to sell it on ebay for scrap for 300 quid because of the the graphics card problems um 
so whilst I was wait, saving up, if you like, to buy a new uh, MacBook, uh, I had an old PC here in the office, which I've had for nearly 10 years. I thought I would try out Ubuntu for local development. I see a lot of Drupal developers uh, using it. Um, so I installed uh, Ubuntu. Um, DDEV was just appearing on the scene as well. So I put that on Ubuntu. I liked it. Found it easy to use. It was very fast and I had no problems with it. I liked it. It was a, it was a good way of working. Very efficient. Got a lot done. Very productive. Um, and it, you know, it, it was okay. But what I find being, uh, what I found using uh, Ubuntu um, is that I couldn't use my sort of graphics software of choice. They just don't work. You hear uh, stories that maybe you can put wine on and maybe you might be able to sort of with via an emulator get an old version of Photoshop going or something like that. But it's, it's not an easy life there. My opinion of the uh, sort of native um, Ubuntu graphics software is low. Um, I, I don't think much of Inkscape uh, or, or GIMP. Uh, dark table for photography is very slow and clunky. So I decided that Linux probably wasn't right for me, all things considered, with what I need to do um, work-wise. So after saving up for a little bit, went back and I, I got myself another second-hand uh, MacBook Pro, um, this time actually from a Drupal developer who, who gets to change his hardware every couple of years on expenses. Um, and everything was working out well, but I was forever having config issues with MAMP, um, running out of memory, sort of big installation. Sorry, you know, I do quite a lot of distribution testing and so on. And some of the heavier weight distributions I found just wouldn't install under MAMP. And, you know, there's all these settings to worry about. I know if you know exactly what you're doing, you can tweak these things and you can, you can get it working. But, you know, I, I had quite a bit of trouble with it when I came back to it. So I got back, I tried DDEV again, having been impressed with it on uh, Linux. Um, put that on the MacBook and, and actually found it to be very, very slow and not, not efficient, not, 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 a, not an easy thing to work with really. And this was, is because it's not so much of DDEV particularly, but because of uh, how Docker works and um, the difficulty that Docker has relating with the, the Mac file system and the mounting and so on. The file access speeds are very, very slow. Or they were back then anyway, things have changed. Um, after that, I tried VirtualBox and Drupal VM. It was okay, but still a bit slow for certain things. So I went back to using MAMP and found that things hadn't got any better. If, if not, they got worse. So uh, I thought I'd take another look at DDEV. Um, through seeing blog posts on Drupal Planet and so on, I'd heard that, um, and maybe uh, Randy can tell us more about this later, I heard that it was now compatible with NFS, which is a, a Linux-based um, sort of file access system. It's been around a long time, very well proven. I thought, well, I'll give it another go. And I found that there was an absolutely vast improvement, a huge improvement. Um, and actually, um, I'm not working with Windows currently. I'm just still to and fro, and I'm using MAMP. Sorry, I'm using uh, DDEV on the Mac at the moment with NFS, and it's it's great. There's nothing wrong with it at all. It's it's, it's a perfectly adequate um, development environment to work with. I don't have a bang up to date MacBook Pro. Mine's uh, all right. It's an i7, so it's well spec. It's got 16 meg of RAM and an SSD, but it's the you know it's the 2013 model. It's 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 not a new machine by uh, any means. Uh, but anyway, DDEV with NFS on Mac is certainly a huge improvement to the uh, earliest iterations of DDEV with uh, you know without NFS. Um, briefly, what's NFS? Well, I don't know much about it. <laughs> Maybe Randy can tell us more. So it's a Linux thing which speeds everything up. Um, it makes DDEV much faster. There's some benchmarks here um, comparing uh, the blue being regular Docker, the speeds that you might get out of particular things, and the red being what they would be um, with using uh, NFS, and the yellow being another uh, mounting system called WebCache. Don't know much about that, but the, 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 you know, the graph, the bar charts there are 
quite uh, compelling in terms of the improvements that have happened to DDEV over the months. Everything's wonderful until you start plugging in external monitors to your MacBook Pro. Then everything starts getting very hot. Um, there's a process called kernel task in a Mac, which is a throttling mechanism designed to slow your Mac down so it doesn't overheat. I find that regularly goes from, you know, uh, not consuming any CPU to consuming 600% of CPU. The, the fans are spinning so fast, it sounds like the blooming thing is going to take off. And uh, as I put down there, your performance goes down the toilet and you're back to square one thinking, how on earth do I make my life faster? External monitors. That doesn't happen when you're just using your Mac normally, single screen, um, everything's fine there. This only seems to happen, with me at least anyway, with um, external monitors. I understand that modern Macs, they don't recommend that you do that, but actually that you invest in an external graphics card uh, and plug your monitors into, into that peripheral. But uh, I haven't gone down that route, and that sounds like another 500 pounds to spend somewhere if, if I go down that route. So this is one of the problems, you know, just working the way that I like to work, things would slow down and performance would suffer and so on. So um, I thought, well, you know, what else is there out there? What about Windows? I, you know, uh, I've been in the PC business for 25 years before I came to Drupal. Uh, I've always used Windows. Um, it's only since um, doing Drupal, really, that I've been working on a Mac. Um, I knew a little bit about Windows subsystem for Linux, and I knew that um, the, the second iteration of that, WSL2, had um, just come out. Going back to my multiple monitor thing, well, Windows support for graphics is completely superior to Mac or Linux. Ask any gamer that, and they'll tell you that's, that's why, uh, well, one of the reasons at least why um, uh, PC has certainly won the gaming wars. Um, and what does uh, WSL2? Well, it allows for, uh, I've got this, <laughs> I'm reading this, I've written it all around. It allows for PC develops, developers to run Linux, a Linux environment on a Windows machine. Uh, now, the first iteration of that, the original Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, was first introduced in 2016, but it, was, it wasn't a full implementation. I don't know a huge amount about the history, but they had to start somewhere, and they started with uh, WSL2, and I think, sorry, WSL1. And I think a lot of this came from the, um, uh, who's the new uh, chief technical guy? Well, say uh, Microsoft, say new, he's been around for a number of years, really. I think he, he embraced the whole open source thing and um, continues to do so. And, uh, um, you know, they saw uh, developers or, or a large group of developers going over to Ubuntu or Mac and, uh, you know, territory, which I think, you know, in terms of heritage, they probably thought was as much theirs as anybody's. And so they wanted to um, do something about it. Um, Windows Subsystem 2 arrived in, in sort of developer preview builds back in 2019. Um, but hardly anywhere, hardly any uh, hardware at the time was supported, and that's been a gradual thing over the time. So, what's the difference between uh, version one and version two? Um, frankly, I don't know what all of these things mean, if I'm being totally honest with you. Uh, but the key things that are important in terms of getting a, a, a development environment up and running um, for Drupal or PHP is, is access to. Um, the full Linux kernel and, and the managed VM. I'm not sure what the full system compatibility is about. Um, but anyway, the, these um, things are now there in WSL2, which uh, you know, are key building blocks um, for making this uh, an attractive development platform. If indeed, as time plays out, it does actually become one. So what's required? Well, you need a PC with virtualization. This is a technology that's on the motherboard. It's in the chips on the motherboard. Uh, most new uh, PCs of the last few years, perhaps 
X, with the exception of you know really budget machines, will have Hyper-V on the motherboard. Um, certainly anything that's current will do. Um, Windows subsystem to generally available for the version 2004, which a bit confusing, that's not a year, that's just a version number. Um, and that re was released quite recently, May 27th. So if you want to install it in your PC, the first thing to do is to go into control panel and go into Windows update. And that will indicate if an update is available and whether um, your machine is going to be compatible, um, whether your hardware, should I say, is going to be compatible with the, the later updates. Um, the hardware is still a limiting factor for some PCs. Um, it's been improved all the time. I know when I first looked at this back in May last year, I had a couple of old laptops. I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And I couldn't install it. The, the, just, the hardware support wasn't there at the time. Um, that's moved on quite a bit. So with this um, desktop PC that I've got in the office here, this tower, um, I reformatted it to start again. I wanted it to be dual boot with both Windows and Ubuntu for occasional use. And also in case I burn out my MacBook Pro again. Uh, so I've got a backup, some redundancy. Uh, so I put Windows on it first and then dual booted it to put Ubuntu on there. So uh, what I found is that my, with my PC as rebuilt with the current version of Windows, it was compatible and suitable for uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, if you've got hardware that isn't compatible, you um, you can register as a Windows Insider. You go to insider insider.windows.com. It's like a developer channel. If you register, that allows you to tweak something in Windows Update, which allows you to um, download preview builds. So uh, if you're if you're in that uh, Insider channel, you need to download a preview build that uh, with a build number higher than one eight nine one seven. Um, the good thing is with Windows, it's fairly reliable with installations. If things go, um, you know, face up, shall we say, um, Windows does allow you to roll back gracefully. I've had to do that a number of times over the years, and it always seems to work. Um, so, not the end of the world if your if your trial with uh, with this doesn't work out. So, what's involved with uh, installing um, WSL on Windows? Uh, well, the easiest way to go about it is to visit ddev.com because they've got it all documented there really well. They've got it in both in formal documentation and in blog posts. And as Rudy mentioned, sorry, as Randy mentioned earlier on, um, there's also a few videos there now as well. So if you if you want a good sort of overall blog post, if you search on or you don't search, you browse on ddev.com for WSL2 colon getting started. Um, that will give you a, a blog post, which in part refers to official documentation, in part talks you step by step what to do with the DDEV relevant parts. Um, so what do you need to do with your PC to make it ready? Well, you've got to go into Windows Features and enable a couple of things. So you can find that in Control Panel, or you can just press the Start button and just type in Windows Features, and Windows will give you that particular dialogue that you need to be looking for and uh, you need to enable windows system subsystem for linux this is after you've done your windows update to get the compatible version obviously um, enable subsystem and you also need to enable virtual machine platform you can do that through the ui or if you run powershell as an administrator there's a one line uh, snippet there which will enable everything that you need and then importantly the second line um, sets the, de the default version to Windows subsystem for Linux 2 as opposed to the earlier iteration 1. Uh, I've got a duplicated slide there <laughs> because I missed a bit. Once you've enabled um, subsystem what you then need to do is visit the Windows Store, which again you find in your Start menu, 
and there you can then download through the Microsoft Store, you can download a Linux distribution. And last time I looked, there were four or five of these that you could choose from. Um, DDEV recommend uh, downloading Ubuntu 20.04, um, which is a new release, which is also the bit that I put on the dual boot on the PC as well. So I already know my way around it in terms of the, um, uh, the command line. Um, important to know, when you install a Linux distribution this way on your PC, you're not getting the full uh, UI version. You're only getting the command line tools. Um, whether the full UI will come along at some stage in the future, uh, I don't know. I expect it will. But what you're getting access to is the command line tools, bash and everything else that that leads to. So moving on, you've then got to install Docker and DDEV. I'm not going to dwell on this particularly because it's all documented and anybody that's already running DDEV or running Lando will be familiar with these kinds of routines for installation. Uh, but firstly, you've got to install uh, Docker Desktop for Windows. You've got to, in, uh, in Docker Desktop, you've then got to enable Windows Subsystem for Linux. Then in the case of DDEV, you need to follow the documentation and install DDEV for Linux, not DDEV for Windows. If you were just running Windows natively, then yes, you would run, you would install DDEV for Windows. But, but here we're running under Linux, so you have to install the right version. And the difference is that the Linux version will actually use the Linux file system, which is much faster than using the Windows uh, file system. The next step is to run MakeSir, which gives you SSL for your dev environment, dead useful. And then, not compulsory, uh, an optional step, but a recommended one, is then also to install Windows Terminal from the Microsoft Store. This is an open source alternative to PowerShell or Commander. Um, and it's, it's evolving all the time. It's already pretty good. I've no doubt it will get a lot better. Um, think of it as like an item uh, alternative if you're a Mac user or um, you know any of the various terminal clients that you get on a, in a, um, uh, a Linux distribution and it's, it's, it's pretty good actually it's not bad um, so where's my stuff when you installed everything on Windows you install Linux where is it all you know if you want to go find a file if you want to install a website download some code, where is it? Well, it's, it's buried, um, I understand quite deliberately, <clears throat> deep down in, in Windows. Um, and frankly, you're not really meant to go there. You just leave Windows to, to do its work here. You certainly don't go and visit that location with File Explorer. Um, there be dragons, I put. Quite simply, if you do, you'll be interacting with the files there based on Windows file permissions as opposed to based on Linux file permissions. And you'll end up in a, uh, a right mess, simply put. So the proper way uh, of doing that is to access the Linux home directory via this uh, shortcut backslash backslash WSL dollar sign. If you follow with that path, all your Unixy, Linuxy permissions are preserved and work just as you would expect to find them on a Mac or on um, your Linux distribution of choice. Um, coming up in a, in a Windows update, which is already, I think, available as a preview release, is a proper shortcut to Linux from the File Explorer, where you can directly get into browsing your home directory and everything that you might have in there. Currently, what I've needed to do at least anyway, is use that shortcut and then add a, a shortcut to the shortcuts under quick access. So I've got a one click link to get me to the right place without um, having to you know, browse all the way down into Windows and risk breaking something when I do so. So what about Windows Terminal, this open source bit of software? It's a multi-purpose application. It's not just for Linux. So you can also use it as an alternative for using the super basic terminal um, command prompt that you've got in Windows. 
or the more advanced but still fairly rudimentary PowerShell. You can also use it for Azure Cloud uh, as well as uh, also for your uh, Linux distribution. Oh, by the way, you can install, you know, if you're one of these people that likes to dabble with uh, Linux distributions, you can install more than one. You can install multiple Linux distributions. So you might have a Ubuntu, a 20, an 18, maybe something else, whatever. Now, a bit of a banana skin warning. Um, when you first access uh, Linux via terminal, you'll be taken down through the Windows path. Um, so um, what you'll find is that life is slow down that path. You know, if you want to run DDEV or whatever you can do, but it's having to operate going via the, white, the Windows file system and just everything is slow. You just, it's just, you know, it's just, that's just how it is. Um, the good thing is that's not how you're meant to use it. Um, as soon as you get into uh, Windows Terminal, you should CD into Home, in my case, username Paul, and that will drop you straight into the Linux file system. And once you're there, it's just like being on Terminal on a Mac. It's just like being in Terminal in Ubuntu. It's pretty much exactly the same. So, so there, there you have it. You've got Linux on uh, Windows as such. And you're straight in. Now I'm not going to do a live demo or anything like that. A couple of reasons. I didn't have proper time to prepare. I wouldn't want it to video something like that in any case, just in case anything went wrong. I haven't had time. Um, only to say, if you've used DDEV, if you've used Lando, if you're on Ubuntu and just used to working at the command line, everything works exactly the same way as you will be used to and familiar with. There's virtually no difference at all. So what I decided to do, uh, you know, after spinning this up myself and mucking about, installing a couple of distributions, doing, you know, working with Composer, downloading a few things, just seeing how it all sort of hung together. I thought, well, you know, this is pretty fast actually. This is not bad at all, I thought. Um, and I thought I'd just do some, I started just by timing a couple of page loads. Um, a couple of variables or a couple of things that you get wide uh, variation with depending upon what operating system you're using or what speed of computer you're using things like how long does a drupal installation take that's a measurable thing where you can compare environment to environment machine to machine once you've got drupal set up and working especially if it's um, a distribution with a lot of modules things like you know uh, Timing the page load speed of the module page is a, a good benchmark. You know, on a slow machine or, you know, in an early version of, 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 of when I was using Windows VM and what have you, it would take sometimes, you know, 20 seconds for the module to page to load up with a, you know, a fully loaded distribution, which, you know, life's too short for that. Uh, but you've got these things that you can measure. So I thought I'd um, run one or two sort of uh, benchmarks, really. But before doing so, important to define the hardware. You know, are we comparing apples with apples? In other words, my dual boot beat PC, is it comparable performance wise with my MacBook Pro? You know, and if it's not, what are the differences? So if we just look at the spec, the PC has got 16 megabyte of RAM. It's got um, a, an Athlon six core CPU. It's getting on a bit now. This first was released for sale back in Q4 2011. It's not a new processor by any means. Um, so that was the, the spec that was being used for um, testing Windows 10 and testing Ubuntu. The MacBook Pro has also got 16 megabyte of RAM. It's got an i7, um, I think 2300 gigahertz CPU. Um, dated uh, second quarter 2013. Both have got uh, solid state drives, SSDs. So between the two machines, the CPU is the primary differentiator. So what is the difference? Well, I went on to CPU benchmark, did a side-by-side -side comparison of both PCs. 
and you've got to, at the bottom there you've got what we call the CPU mark the Athlon the AMD chip the PC chip in other words it's got a rating of 3642 and the i7 has got a rating of 6063 I have not taken a deep dive into what those figures are um, presumably it doesn't mean the the i7 is twice as fast because uh, you know that that AMD chip isn't a bad chip anyway um, but you know anecdotally we can probably say that the i7 CPU is uh, a fair bit faster than the AMD let's let's just you know take that for what it what it is so what about the benchmarks then so did a couple of things so we've got did three tests we've got mac os now my macbook pro native ubuntu on the pc and then windows 10 running windows subsystem for linux on the pc as well and just a reminder by the cpu benchmark the mac ought to be considerably faster or a fair bit faster shall we say than either windows or ubuntu so I tested this with a big distribution, it's called Drupal. It's a good distribution actually, if you're curious, take a look at it. It comes with a lot of demo content, it takes quite a long time to install. And, um, and, and how I timed it, it's a, a Drupal installation, if you haven't done for a while or whatever, it's like a two part process. You've got to do the first load, and then you've got to pause, enter the, the uh, database details and passwords and that sort of thing, and then you've got to resume the installation. So I paused the stopwatch halfway through. The, the, this installation uh, was done literally with a stopwatch on the phone. So let's say there's a margin of error of plus or minus two seconds, just allowing for reaction time, stopping and starting the stopwatch. And uh, the Mac, it took uh, nearly five minutes to install. As I say, it's a big, it's a big distribution. It's hefty. Um, native Ubuntu, a little bit better, but not much, frankly. Um, and in theory, on a much slower machine, um, coming in a bit better at uh, four minutes. A bit of a difference under Windows Subsystem for Linux on DDEV, running DDEV, seven minutes 32. But again, bear in mind, um, you know, this, this, the CPU on this machine, somewhat slower than the CPU in the, on the MacBook. So you, you've got to take that into account. So on a home page, what I then did is via Chrome Inspector, I did a full uh, hard reload. Uh, on the Mac 5.2, Ubuntu 1.8, catching up now, Windows subsystem for Linux, 2.4 seconds. And then a second load, obviously with stuff cached in the browser, 2.1, 1.1, but then look at this, Windows Subsystem for Linux, 0.7, beating everything on a much slower PC. And then going into the module page, just doing the first load, 7.5, 3.6, 6.2, but then on a subsequent load, I don't know whether Memcache or Redis or whatever is part of DDEV, maybe Randy can confirm that or not that for us, but on the second reload of the module page and considerably faster than the first 2.9 1.8 so that's that's the overview in, in conclusion um, I still like my three monitor PC setup um, I still have doubts whether using a MacBook Pro laptop on an ongoing basis is um, maybe the uh, the best um, solution for um, that. I'll need to get bound round to buying some uh, new hardware at some point in the future. And it's nice to have some redundancy hardware at home, you know, in case I drop the MacBook, leave it on a train, whatever. Um, so it's, it's good to have a, a, a backup system so that your work isn't interrupted. But all in all, I've been very impressed with. Um, Windows subsystem for Linux running DDEV. Um, I expect this is just the beginning and that things will improve a lot. 
um, as it gets more attention, more development and that sort of thing. Um, so there you go, over to questions. But frankly, if, this, if there are questions, apart from my own experience, they're probably better directed at Randy actually. But, um, but anyway, that's how I got on with it. I, I was suitably impressed with it. My, my own experience is uh, even better than yours. Uh, when I run, when I run WSL two in parallels on a Mac, in other words, already virtualized, it's faster than on the Mac um, with NFS. So it it is. I think people will be switching from the Mac to Windows just to use WSL two, and because they're annoyed with Apple about Catalina and stuff like that. Mm. I can certainly see people uh, at least trying it out, at least. And the thing is, a lot of us have got a PC lying around at home, you know, from days gone by. I think it's quite a, an easy thing to experiment with, really, at, at a very low cost. I think one of the other things that um, is, is worth noting is even if it's only the same speed as it is on a Mac, you can pick up a Windows machine at a lot less cost. Absolutely. So it, it's, it, it may not save you time, but it will save you money. Um, and if, if, if cost is one of the reasons you're debating switching back, then not quite no brainer, but it's certainly a big tick in the Windows box. If only, if only Sketch was a bit more... Uh, Pro uh, Windows and uh, Linux. And uh, t I tell you what, I mean, I know Sketch has got a lot of um, fans. Um, I, I, I don't do much collaborative work, which is where Sketch and Figma have uh, big strengths for working with teams, but just for general illustration work and that kind of thing, knocking out a logo. Affinity Designer, you just cannot go wrong with it. It costs about 50 quid and there's no monthly subscription. It's, it's brilliant, it's, it's really good. Um, and the great thing is, if I did go down the window through, um, I've got access to all of the software that I use on a Mac. Affinity is available for Windows. Obviously, the Adobe stuff is. Um, so it, it would be uh, a very good alternative, I believe. The, the one thing that gives me trouble, um, and I'm a big fan of WSL2. I think it's an amazing breakthrough, and I think it's astonishing that Microsoft did that and that the quality is so high and the performance is so good, but it's a, a, a big context switch. So you're here, you are working on in a GUI system and you know how to do stuff and you do it. And then you need to go into the WSL2 window and you're in Linux. All of a sudden you're in Linux. You're using a whole different command set. You're thinking about things differently. Um, so just, and then of course, when you're in, when you're using DDEV, you DDEV SSH into the into the container, and you're in a different Linux there. So, yeah. you, so you got three different worlds that you're working in. But um, I I like it quite a lot. I think it's extremely well done. Has anybody else tried it at all? It'd be interesting to know. No, my Windows machine's 32 bit and makes our Internet Explorer look relatively new. <laughs> I did do a, a screencast um, starting from the very beginning with DDEV. I pasted that into the chat. Um, it, it starts from nothing. It starts from a clean Windows machine and goes through WSL2 and setting and all the way through to using DDEV with a quick tutorial on DDEV. So if you're interested in trying it out, that's there. Right. Okay. Um, well, like I said, we've got quite a bit of ground to cover this evening. Um, I guess it's over, over to Oliver next for his uh, talk, um, Taking Flight with Tailwind uh, CSS. Over to you, Oliver. Okay, can everybody, everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine. Lovely, okay. Uh, let me see, can I share my screen? I should be able to. I should have got all my things in the right place here. Um, I 
had this last time. Changing the speaker notes doesn't work. Just give us a quick refresh. Okay, I think that's okay now. Oh, you can all see the second slide. Spoil the surprise. Cool. So, um, yeah, thanks, Paul, and everybody for yeah, inviting me back again to come do another talk for Drupal Yorkshire. Um, this time we're doing uh, the Tailwind CSS talk. And I remember we talked about Tailwind a little bit before doing the, the, the other talk I did. So, yeah, it'd be nice to go a little bit more sort of in depth in, into that as part of this talk. And yeah, just a, f a fun fact, these sides are built with, with Tailwind for all the styling, which I think is, is quite interesting. Um, using a, a package called RevealMD, which is RevealJS in Markdown, um, and then using Tailwind to do all the styling, which I'm doing a blog post about soon, but yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Oliver, I'm a, a software developer. Uh, currently work for Invica, I work remotely from home. Um, as well as doing some freelance work sort of on the side as well. Uh, I organize the PHP South Wales meetup at the moment. Um, used to organize Drupal Bristol meetups and the Drupal Camp, Drupal Camp Bristol and PHP Southwest as well. But right now I'm just doing the PHP South Wales meetup. And yeah, this is my website and I'm OP Davis pretty much everywhere on Twitter and everywhere. So yeah, any sort of feedback from anybody afterwards uh, on Twitter or elsewhere would be, would be awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember whether I used this slide last time. Yeah, I can't actually remember which talk I did last time. Um, but this is my typical sort of tech stack. Uh, I've doing Drupal for 12 or 13 years now. It's just gone over 10 years full time doing Drupal. Uh, but I do not work with Symfony and some other work with some other page, mostly PHP and JavaScript based things. Uh, but one of the interesting things is I've been able to use Tailwind or have been using Tailwind even with all of these things. So that's, it's quite nice to have something there for some sort of consistency, switching between frameworks and things. So first of all, what is Tailwind? And Tailwind, according to their website, is a utility first CSS framework for rapidly building custom designs. So the word utility first is, is quite interesting. We'll sort of cover more of that as we go. But essentially, rather than having um, a, a large set of components and you need to have markup that matches those, you know, that, they, that it needs, uh, it's primarily built up of very small utility classes. So um, Bootstrap has had some of these for a while, something like call MD6, like for setting the, the width of columns. Tailwind goes even lower than that and makes a, a number of, um, utility classes for things like margin and padding and text size, which other frameworks like Bootstrap are now doing. Um, but Tailwind has been doing this, you know, it was built up from that as a, as a primary thing rather than added in them afterwards. And then, yeah, another key point on this, I think for me is custom designs. So there isn't sort of one standard uh, Tailwind looking site like you might get with Bootstrap. If you look at a Bootstrap site, you can usually go, oh yeah, that's a, that's a Bootstrap website. Uh, but it's not because the tailwind classes are so low level. Uh, there's not really a concept of of, something, of looking at it and saying it's a it's a tailwind site. Uh, it, it's super customizable. So uh, it comes with a configuration file and it gives you a lot of defaults out of the box. But we can customize what we need and add stuff in and take stuff away, which is fine. We'll just see the examples of that in a minute. Uh, I think this was something that I said, or at least this is my interpretation of it. Um, it's more than a framework, it's a, an engine for creating design systems. So as I said, it comes with a number of defaults, with things like colors and fonts and paddings and widths and everything. Um, and it, g it gives us then, um, those are constraints that we can use in our, in our projects. So what we don't have, or what we can avoid by using a, a design system is we've got consistent colors, a consistent font weight, a consistent spacing values to use. And we don't end up with a, a 17 pixel padding here and an 18 pixel there and a slightly different blue, which you know, looking at it with your eyes, exactly the same, but it's one or two hex, hex values out. So it prevents bloat in our applications by using consistent values across the project. 
So some of the things that Tailwind includes, um, this is a, a little bit out of date now, because given we've had a few releases since I did these slides, uh, but text, border and background color, uh, font size, font weight, and font family, uh, alignment, so left, left, right, center, justified alignment, uh, padding, margin, negative margin, uh, there's flex box helpers, there's positioning for absolute and relative positioning, uh, lists, um, Z index, opacity, uh, screen reader visibility. So, so there's a, an SR only class, which is sim similar to the um, element invisible or visually hidden class that we've seen in Drupal. Uh, placeholder colors, first child, last child, nth child. Uh, CSS grid has been added in uh, fairly recently, but quite recently. Uh, a lot of people wanted CSS grid support in Tailwind. Uh, transitions, transforms, uh, and then some that I like are uh, these spacing and divide classes. So you can just set a, a value on the parent and say the spacing between the children should be uh, a value of eight and it adds the um, margin on the children and, and deals with the, the first child case and everything, which is really nice. And yeah, there's a lot more, but these are just a few that I want to highlight. And these are all generated from a, a single customizable config file. So uh, a couple of examples. Um, this is the Laravel Nova uh, web page. So this is built with Tailwind. Uh, this is the, the Firefox Send website. This is also built with Tailwind. Uh, and you know, this is a Drupal meetup, so hopefully this looks familiar to a lot of people. Uh, but this is a version that I built of Bartik, which is just plain HTML with Tailwind that I built in about an hour, I think, maybe with this, and it uses some Vue.js or some Alpine.js now for um, toggling the menus. Um, as you can see, out of just three examples, they all, like, there's not really a, a common look between these three examples. They all look very different, but they are all using Tailwind under, under the hood. Okay, so how do we use Tailwind? So we use Tailwind by styling elements by applying classes to the elements directly. So what we don't have is, well, there is a style sheet, but what we don't start doing is for every component, adding new CSS for every single component. Tailwind will generate all the classes that, it, that you need or too many classes, more classes that you could need. You pick and choose the ones that you're going to use. And then we add, start by adding them directly into our markup. So there's, there's some benefits to that, but we don't need to think of lots of class names. We don't need to switch between um, our HTML and our CSS because we're just doing everything in one file. So there's a lot less context switching. So there's a, a speed uh, gain from that, always switching between different files. Um, and as I said, because we're building with utility classes, we don't usually need to write any custom CSS at all. I mean, you, you still can. Um, they added gradient support in the, in the new version that's released this week, but uh, that was typically an example of something we'd have to write custom CSS for. Um, and that's totally fine. But like that, that Bartek example, like there was no custom CSS there at all. Uh, it was just, just tailwind classes out of the box and applying those classes to exist to existing markup. So as I said, there are some benefits. Um, so, yeah, typically you aren't wasting time, uh, say, switching between CSS and HTML and back and forth. Uh, you're seeing everything in one file, just as you're looking at it. Uh, and also, you don't need to think of like class names. Like, I remember looking at sidebar left in a wrapper something. Like, essentially, if something is a flex container and that's all it's doing, uh, give it a class of flex. Like, it's a flex container. It doesn't need, um, you don't need to sit there and think of these crazy long, BEM style names for everything. Uh, your, CSS, your CSS stops growing. Uh, so because you're reusing the existing classes all the time, uh, you're not repeating different values in different style sheets. You're not having to keep writing new CSS for every new component. So that you're, unless you, can, you know, if you do you write custom CSS, but typically then you don't need to, the, amount, the amount of CSS you need to write is a lot, dip, is a lot smaller. And yeah, it's lots more. Uh, a mixed, <clears throat> and making changes feel safer. So because typically if you're writing style sheets and then changing them, you know, those changes are global and could affect anything in your, in your site. 
is changing markup, you know that that's got a local scope. So you can be happy that changing something in your markup is only going to affect that particular element and not have some knock-on effect elsewhere. So the next few slides are some screenshots uh, from the Tailwind CSS site itself. Um, if you want to see the whole thing, then you can go to the website and, and look at it. But hopefully this should give us some a bit more visual idea of, of how it works. So in this example, this building a, a little contact contact card. So you can see that in the, the bottom right of the, of the slide. And then the markup is in the, the top left. And there's a couple of classes here already. So BG white is setting a background of white and rounded LG is setting some, some rounded corners on, on the card. And then we have a height and a width that are set on the image. Uh, so H for height and then W for width. And, and that's it, that's it there for now. Uh, we can add a, a P6 class to add a, a padding to the whole card. Uh, we can add rounded full to give the image uh, fully rounded, 100% border radius. Uh, we can then use MX auto, so M for margin, and then X for the X axis, so left and right, and then setting that to be auto. Uh, we can make the text, the H2 larger by using text LG, so text large. There's a, a some of them use numeric values like height and width, but text uses small, medium, large, extra large, etc. like t-shirt sizing. Uh, we can change the color of the text by giving a text of purple, purple 500. So the text or the colors uh, have uh, names of the colors and then a sliding scale of everything from 100 to 900, but starting very light to going to very dark. So 500 is, is a mid-level mid purple. Uh, and then we can set some gray text on, on using text gray 600. And then finally, if you want to center everything, we can do that with text center on the, on the wrapping div. So um, the actual example on the website starts looking at responsive things as well. Um, and so other things, we'll, we'll get to that in this talk, but yeah, I think that should be enough to just give us a flavor of how we start applying these classes and how we can build styling using the existing classes that Tailwind gives us. So how do we install Tailwind? Let's start by taking a drink of water. Uh, first option is to use a CDN. So there is a, an unpackaged link which has the whole um, generated version out of the box that we can use. Uh, that's fine if you just want to sort of start prototyping something or um, yeah, just want to test something out quite quickly. Um, but if you want to get the most out of Tailwind, you need really should install it via NPM. And that's what they suggest that you do. Um, so there's some advantages um, or some disadvantages to using the CDN so that we, we can't customize anything. We've got no access to the configuration at all. Um, we can't enable additional features and we can't install extra plugins. So if, if we want the flexibility, then we need to install it via NPM. So how do we do that? Uh, we can do it using NPM install or we can use it, do it using Yarn as well and it's um, just called Tailwind CSS, and you can install it in our project. And this will add it into our package.json file as a dependency, as a, as a dev dependency. So now we've done that, we need to actually add Tailwind into our CSS. So um, Tailwind CSS, as I don't think I've said already, is a, is a post CSS plugin. So I typically just write post CSS, uh, which is why there's a, a .p CSS file um, here, or this is an example of one. Um, you can use it with SAS or less or some sort of pre-processor as well if you want to, but I typically just use post-CSS here. Uh, we can see these at Tailwind directives. So essentially these are placeholders for where Tailwind is going to output its things. So differently to SAS and less, which is a pre-processor, post-CSS is sort of a post-processor. So it's going to run after it's compiled everything. And what Tailwind will do is looking for these placeholders like at Tailwind base, and then it'll replace these placeholders with Tailwind's actual styles. So, so the bit split into three sections. The first is the base, so it's just some resets. Uh, pulls in a couple of different libraries just to give a, a quite intelligent sort of reset to everything. Uh, then we've got some components, which I believe is still just the container. 
Um, I don't think we have any additional components in there in core yet. Uh, and then the last one is the utilities, which is you know, got the, the main the main part of it. Uh, as I said, you can still write your own custom styles. So this is how you should do it. And because of the way the cascade works, um, you should put the custom start your, your own custom styles after the Tailwind base styles, then put your custom components after Tailwind's components, and then your custom utilities after Tailwind's utilities. So this means the way again the way the cascade works is we can apply uh, components to the base and they will override, and then likewise again we can override components by adding utilities to them. So maybe for example we could set a padding on, on a component at a component level, and then override that padding by adding utility directly to that component as well. Whereas yeah, you know, if we didn't order them in this way, then that wouldn't work uh, because of specificity. So now we've got a source file built, we need to process it somehow. Uh, and there's a build command built into Tailwind to do this. So we can just run Tailwind build and we can specify uh, the path to the source file, which is our, our .pcss or postcss file, or your SAS file or whatever. And then we specify the output file. So we're just going to output just an, a normal plain CSS file. And in this case, we're doing it into a build, a build directory, first of all. Uh, and here's just an example, a couple of the utilities, these are the text align utilities. So we've got one for left, one for center, one for right, and one for justify. Um, obviously there's a lot more, but this is just yeah, a very small example of, of some of the stuff that it generates. And, and most of them are one line uh, properties, one line rules in, inside each utility. So, and they're very um, so tied, to, they're pretty, like if you want one um, that says to text right, you can pretty much guess that it's text right in most cases. It's pretty intuitive, the, the things that it generates. So using the build command is, is fine. Um, so like, again, if you just want to test things out and just see how it works. Uh, if you can be building it a lot, then I tend to use something like uh, Webpack Encore or Laravel Mix or something to, to do the building, some sort of, or gulp, something that's going to, do the processing. So typically I've been using Webpack on call, which is part of um, Symfony components, but isn't, isn't tied to Symfony at all. So again, you can add this in as a, an NPM dependency in the same way that we did with Tailwind itself, by using NPM install. Uh, and then we need to add a configuration file. This is webpack.config.js, and this is where we're just going to configure uh, on call. So the, the key things here we need to uh, is the set output path. So we need to tell we got output our compiled things into our build directory. Uh, for this example, again, the, the public path is going to be just be slash build as well. If this was a, a Drupal theme, it would be sort of themes custom theme name build, probably. And then we're going to add a style entry. So we're going to add one called app, which just means that our generated file is going to be app.css. And then we pass through the source file, which is our, our post CSS file. And then from call, we also try to enable the post CSS loader. So it, it knows to enable post CSS and, and run it. And behind the scenes, this is just generating a, a webpack config file, like a standard webpack config file behind the scenes. It's just gives you a lot of helpers for doing that. Uh, in our post CSS file, we need to enable Tailwind itself. So we can just require uh, an array of plugins. So typically I use uh, a couple of other ones as well, but in this case, we'll just use, um, I like reps using some like nesting and um, custom variables to, to, to replicate some of the features of SAS. But in this case, we can just use, uh, just require Tailwind itself. And then to do an actual build, we're gonna run um, Encore Dev, which is just going to make a development version uh, of, of our assets. In this case, it's, you can see that it just says um, one file written to our, our disk directory, to our, to our build directory, it should be. Uh, and in this case, it's quite big because it's got everything, everything in it. And now we've got that built, uh, we just need to reference it in our CSS. So in our Drupal theme, we'd add it into, some, into a, one of our libraries files, but this, this is just a plain HTML example. We're just going to add 
uh, a star sheet link to our built app.css file. And then we can just start applying those classes that we saw previously. Okay, so next we're gonna look at uh, interaction states. So most of the, at least the, the, the text align examples that we saw, like a lot of people just go, isn't this very similar to inline styles? And a lot of those sort of are, um, but this is where we sort of start differentiating from things that we can't really do with inline styles. So inline styles, we can't really do things like hover and focus and group hover and that type of thing. Whereas with Tailwind we can. Uh, so the format for these are uh, some sort of st are states, such as you know, hover, focus, group focus, or whatever. Um, then a separator. So typically that tends to be a colon. Um, again, we can configure that if we need to. Uh, and then the class name. So to apply text red 500 when we're hovering, we just say hover colon text red 500. And this works with pretty much every, any class that Tailwind generates. And um, as I said, there's a number of these interaction states that we can use as well. Uh, and this is the CSS that it generates. So our, our text so at red 500 is uh, F5656565, too many six fives. Um, but then we can see we also get a hover variation there and a focus variation. So what, what the CSS is doing is it's going to escape uh, the colon, the separator colon, uh, which is fine. Um, and then add the, the hover pseudo class at the end. So, so I quite like this because then it's, you, all you're doing is just applying any class and just prefix prefix in the name of the state. You're not having to do sort of red hover 500 or something like we're not changing the class name in any way. We're just sort of prefixing it, which is quite quite a nice uh, version, I think. Yeah, and and then using that in our class, we just say you know it's text five red 500 um, normally, and then on hover it's going to be text red 800 and that will apply um, the appropriate classes. So as I said, everything's very configurable. Um, this is a, a snippet of the, the default configuration file that Tailwind is using behind the scenes. And you can see there's this key called variant and then a list of modules and variations that we have options for. So most of these, I think in fact all of them have responsive. So they also get uh, responsive classes. We'll look at that in a moment. We can see background color. We've also got hover and focus um, utilities that get generated. Um, so again, if we didn't want um, hover and focus for one of these, we could you know, override this in our own custom config file. Or if we didn't want to use this at all, we could in fact remove them completely. So it does generate responsive classes as well. Uh, it follows a very similar format, but rather than the state, we're gonna pass through a, a value for a, a screen. Um, then again, our separator and then the class name. Um, so in the default config, we get this screens key and the t-shirt sized again, so small, medium, large, extra large. Uh, I think these are the same as the ones that Bootstrap use now. These, the, in the very early versions of Tailwind, they were slightly different to the ones Bootstrap use, but I think these are the same now. Um, and these will minimum width um, values. So it will generate a number of, mi of um, minimum width media queries. And again, if you want, if you don't need extra large in your project, you can take the extra large value out in, in your config file. And then they just won't get, they won't generate any at all. And if your project needs small to be slightly different, again, you can override them and, and it will generate the different variations for you. And how do we apply them? Uh, we just prefix the class the name with the name of the screen. So in the case, MD flex. Uh, and we can also chain these. So if we want something to be uh, a, a background red on medium screens when we hover over it, we can do that by chaining um, the responsive prefix, the screen and the interaction state together. So this is the CSS that it generates. Uh, so block is display block. And then, as I said, med min minimum width media queries. So 640 pixels and above, um, we have SM block and then 768 and above is gonna be MD block. So again, this is quite nice because again, we're just prefixing the name of our class with our, with our screen name. Not having to do like call MD6 like with bootstrap and having to actually change the name of our class in any way, which I think is quite nice. 
So here's another, another example. Uh, this is just building some simple columns. So on a, on a mobile device, uh, we're gonna, everything's going to be display block and full width. And then on a medium screen, we're going to use display flex to put the two columns next to each other and then give each one a, a width of one half. So again, I quite like having literally it say one half. I think it's very descriptive and it's very easy to remember uh, actually what it, what it does. So keeping things small, um, we can control the file size in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first way is just to remove any plugins and variants that we're not using. So if, if you take a look at that variance key again in our configuration file, um, these are the ones we get here by default. But if we say that maybe on this project, we're not going to use any aligned self utilities, we can just set that to be false. And when we run uh, the build command, it just won't generate any classes for that at all. Uh, and again, if, and if we don't want hover or focus utilities for background color, we can just take those out. And again, they just won't get generated at the time. So that's one way of doing it uh, manually. And see, again, we can do the same thing for screens. So again, if we, if we don't want, or we don't need uh, an extra large screen on this project, we can remove it and those won't get generated. And if we don't need so many shades of gray on this project, we can take that again out of our config file and those just won't get generated when we do the build. Um, so the problem with this, I guess, is this needs to be done manually, um, but there is, an op there is another option that we can do this automatically. And this is done by using a tool called Purge CSS. And this is just a tool that scans um, your templates primarily and looks for, tries to do sort of string matching and says, um, we've got a class that's in text red 500. Do we use that in our markup anyway? And if we don't, it will just remove it. Um, and then as of Tailwind 1.4, it's included by default, which is pretty cool as well. So this is very much a best practice. Um, as I said, it gives you, Tailwind gives you too much out of the box or more than you get, you're really going to use on a project. And it's, I think the last time I did it, it was like 1.6 meg. Um, so yes, that's followed that it, created that was uncompressed and unminified as well. Um, so purging, purging the market, uh, the classes against your markup is definitely best practice. So as of um, Tailwind C1.4, uh, we've got this purge key that we can add to our configuration file and we can give a, a list of paths or patterns to match against. And we can just say, here's our templates or our HTML and our view or our JSX or our twig templates or whatever. And then again, at build time, it's just Tailwind or, or Purge CSS is just going to scan those, look for any classes we're not using and then just remove them. Um, so this will happen, uh, if you could run this, it's going to be our development version. Um, that will just keep everything. Um, so everything is there for us by default when we're going to be building locally. But then when we're going to do a production build, then we're going to want to run a different command. So on call prod. And this node environment variable needs to be set for purge CSS to do it, to enable purging. Um, the other way of doing it would be to set it inside the webpack config, which is what I usually do. Um, but this command will trigger both to say, this is a production build. Um, this will do the purging. It will minify the resulting file uh, and compress it as well. So there's a couple of techniques that we can use. Um, again, a pretty common sort of first opinion is, is this must be really difficult to maintain having these duplicated classes everywhere, particularly for things like you know, buttons, maybe for example, that you, know, you don't have to redefine the same set of classes for every button. So there's yeah, a couple of ways we can get around this. Yeah, and we can, Avoid repetition by extracting components. Um, but first of all, yeah, yeah, does something justify becoming a component? So for something like um, like a nav bar on a side, we're only going to get one nav bar. So in that case, I probably wouldn't justify, I wouldn't consider that to be a component um, unless it's something I want to extract maybe for readability. Um, but that's probably something I would just leave being in line. And yeah, and then could the duplication be moved elsewhere? So make like Drupal 8 uses Twig, uh, so we could use Twig partials, or if you're using Vue, we could use some Vue components. 
uh, WordPress uses template paths, so we could move the duplication into one of those files, and then we don't have any duplication because we've got one version of the classes that we can just reuse in multiple places. So, so here's an example. Um, this is just looping over a, a list of navigation items that are stored somewhere else. And rather than redefining these same list of classes everywhere, we've only actually got this, this list of classes in one place now because we're looping over them. Uh, if you look at this, if you just, just do view source on this page, and also you're going to see them multiple times, but from a, a development perspective, like if we wanted to increase some padding or make some changes here, we, we need to do it in one place and that will update all of them automatically. Yeah, another option is to use like, this using a, a twig include. So I've got a, a, a this is just generating um, two lists of classes. This is from a, a martial arts site I was building. Um, so yeah, it's going to just output the, the adult class at the top and the kids class at the bottom. Um, but I've extracted a component called the class list and that's where all the duplicate classes live. Uh, or what would be the duplicate classes actually. So there aren't any duplicate classes in this case now. Uh, and what I'm doing is passing in the data that's dynamic, so pass through the, the classes that we need and which type of class we're going to output. But yeah, all the markup has been, is, is consolidated into one place using my twig partial. Uh, so the other option we can use, uh, if, if we can't use like a template uh, component, Tailwind does give us this option to use something called add apply. And uh, this is something that comes from the less, the less preprocessor. And essentially, we can use any of the classes that we've already seen, and we can just say add apply. And then when PostCSS goes over the, does the build, it will replace those with the values that, that, that adding the class would have done. So uh, in this case, it's going to you know, apply text small and no underline of font bold, et cetera, et cetera. Um, something that we, it currently doesn't do is apply for the pseudo classes for something like hover. Uh, we couldn't do at apply hover colon BG blue 700 uh, as things stand currently. Uh, you need to actually define that as a separate separate thing. Uh, although as of 1.7 that was released this week, uh, there's an experimental feature where you can enable at apply for complex classes. Um, and it's meant to work the way uh, by doing at apply hover colon whatever. So it's not in there officially yet, but um, it is option option. It is there and we can opt into it um, for now anyway. So if we were to do that, this is what we'd get. So it's a bit similar to Twi um, to like extends in, in SAS or something, but rather than grouping all the, the rules together, it's gonna actually make its own um, contained button class rather than joining it with everything else. So again, this is just the same markup we would have we would have got if we'd have or well, the same styling we would have had if we'd have just used the actual classes on the, the element itself. Um, something to mention, I guess, at, at this point, I don't have a slide about it, but typically I think people reach for at apply um, a little bit early. Then the, whilst it does make the CSS reusable, what you don't get is the actual structure. And a lot of the time that's just as important. So that's where using this type of thing, um, it's fine to say, yeah, here's a button class and a, a you know, maybe a button wrapper or, or something. Um, but then you need to know that that needs to be there. Whereas the nice thing about having the, the partials there is that yeah, we get that structure by default, I guess. Let's take another drink of water. Okay, so everything pretty much we've seen so far has been done with the stock Tailwind, or the default Tailwind install. So let's look how we can customize Tailwind. Uh, but Tailwind has another command called init, which just creates uh, or initializes a configuration file. And the configuration file is typically called tailwind.config.js. And this is what it looks like. It's just a JavaScript object. Um, anybody who used Tailwind sort of prior to 1.0, like this looked very different and it generated like a massive JavaScript object. And it was sort of your responsibility to sort of maintain that over time. Um, there was a default one that they used behind the scenes that we saw um, some snippets of earlier, and it will merge your config on top of uh, its internal config. So this is very much like just your overrides and your additional things, and, and this what I think is quite nice. Excuse me. 
Um, yeah, so in this one, we can add um, a new utility here called text and in, inherit. We can add a new color called inherit. So we can do that by adding it into the colors, uh, and into the colors objects, I guess. And that will add a new color called inherit, and then we'll, that will generate a new text inherit class and a BG inherit class. Um, sorry, this dog is shaking. Um, that's fine, but in this case, it's going to override all the co other colors. So it's going to remove all the default colors and then just give us um, just one color in this case, uh, which is usually fine because if you're working on a project with a designer and you've maybe got um, like a, a palette of colors you need to use, then you can just say completely disregard the defaults and just use my defined colors. Uh, if you wanted to add an additional color, um, then you can put it inside the extend key instead, and that will extend the color palette or extend the default theme and add it on top of rather than the roofing. Uh, a couple of other options um, that aren't there by default, but are quite useful. One is, is prefix. So I use this in Drupal 7, uh, the Drupal 7 version of the theme that I maintain. Uh, because we've got a class like block that we saw earlier on, which is display block in Tailwind, uh, but it's also block in Drupal as in sort of sidebar blocks and things. Um, so in the Drupal, Drupal 7 version of these themes, I was adding a prefix, which just is a string, and that will be added in front of any class that Tailwind generates. So there's typically TW dash or U dash utility. Um, and that just avoids any conflicts with you know, standard Drupal markup or CMS framework markup, or if you're using uh, another framework, a CSS framework, like maybe using Bootstrap and you want to you know, not have clashes, then you can just say again, just say prefix tailwind classes with something so that everything's going to be unique. Uh, and then you can also say important is true if you want every tailwind class to be um, exclamation sign important on everything which for utilities isn't you know, necessarily a bad thing because if you apply a class to, uh, to a, an element, you want it to be, you, know, you want it to do something and not get overridden. Uh, there's another option we can pass to it, which is full. Uh, and that is just going to generate, give us the whole JavaScript object like it would have done with pre Tailwind 0.1, uh, 1.0. Uh, and again, if you want to just maintain the whole thing, you can um, rather than merge it. Uh, so also, we can extend Tailwind with plugins. Um, I maintain a couple of them myself. Um, one that I maintain is one called Tailwind CSS List Reset. Um, this was a, a class that was there prior to 1.0 uh, and got removed. So I just wrapped it up into a, a plugin that I can just uh, add and reuse. Uh, so there's a, a plugins key in the config file. And there we can just say require the plugin. Uh, and this is what the list reset class does. Uh, essentially, just says list star none and padding zero. So something that you know I've re used on some projects. There. I think it's that's the default option now in, t in Tailwind as of 1.0. Occasionally, I do like you know, going back and if I need to add it into a project, um, doing it in a plugin is is a nice reusable way of doing it. Uh, and the plugin itself is just a, a JavaScript file. It was one JavaScript file. And Tailwind gives us some functions that we can call, like this one is called add utilities. And in there we can just call pass through an object, <laughs> sorry, you my dog in the background, an object of, of CSS, sorry, let me let dog out. Sorry. Um, yeah, so our key is going to be the name of our class. This is this type of reset. And then we're just going to specify um, the keys are the CSS property, so list style in a, a camel case way, yeah, uh, which is none, and padding is zero. And then we're just going to specify the variants that we, that we get passed through. So if we want responsive versions or whatever, we'll generate those for us. Um, the other way to extend this as well is just you can just add classes into your. CSS, which I don't have a slide for again, but we can see an example of that in a, in a moment. Um, okay, let's have a, look at a little demo. Um, 
the demo I did recently, so we've seen um, rebuilding Bartik um, page. Uh, a couple I've done one, which is rebuilding Acquia, Acquia's platform. I've done one, so I'm in the middle of doing rebuilding platform SH is a, a, a fun one. Um, before I did this talk with PHP Hampshire, I thought it would be fun to rebuild the symphony.com website, or at least part of it. Um, so this is what it looks like, like the actual real website looks like. And then this is the, the version that I built. Again, I'm just doing it from scratch using plain HTML. Um, so not copying and pasting any CSS from the main website itself. And this is all done using Tailwind on, on top. So have a quick look about how this is actually put together. And let's see, this is all on GitHub as well, if people want to take a look at this afterwards. So it's pretty similar to what we've, what we've already looked at in terms of setup. Uh, we've got a Tailwind config file. And um, yeah, it's just a plain HTML page. So we're just going to say purge. Uh, any classes that we don't find inside this HTML file. Uh, we're overriding some font families so they match um, Symphony, Symphony's ones. And we're going to extend the color palette. So because we're inside the extend here, um, we're going to say like override this blue 500 rather than um, and keep you know the 100, 200 and everything else in there as well. Uh, I've added a gray 50 and set you know, these values in here as well. And I've also added one for silver, which isn't, isn't there by default at all. Um, doing something, I don't know whether this is a bit hacky, but this is, there's been some discussions about adding dark mode support into Tailwind. Like this is sort of the way they recommend doing it currently on um, the documentation page of using a media query uh, with a, a raw value, which you know, works fine. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing a, an official supported version of, of this. And, and then let's override a couple of variants here. So we're going to also set the border width as well as generating responsive classes. We're going to generate some hover and some focus styles as well. And then there's no custom plugins in this one at all. Uh, the Webpack config file is pretty much what we saw in the slides in terms of setup, although the output path is going into web build. And uh, let's see here, yeah, this is set in the node environment in the config files. So we don't need to do it when we run the command itself. Um, and yeah, this is how the, the source file looks like. So really important tailwind base classes at the top. Um, setting some default styles for links here using add apply. So uh, give it a nice dark red and slightly larger text. Um, and yeah, if, if I was to try this with 1.7, in fact, I should be able to also do at apply hover underline here and also focus underline. So at some point, I need, that's only just about this week, but I need to give it a try and have a play with that. Then we're going to import Tailwind's components. And then I've got my own custom component, which is a, a nav item. So just applying display flex and then setting a gray color and making the text extra small. But then on large screens, we can bump that size up to be small rather than extra small. And then there's our, our custom dark screen from, that's added by that media query that we saw. And we're going to say on dark screens, make it 200, which is a light gray rather than 900, which is a dark gray. Uh, then we get Tailwind's utilities and then a couple of custom, custom utilities. So um, Symphony site uses um, this filter contrasting for switching and making the logo a different color on dark mode. This is light mode. So I just wrap these up into their own little utilities. Um, again, so best practice, like they so encourage you to make like a range of them. So I've decided one and a hundred, but maybe you should, I do like one, 10, 20, 50, hundred or something. And so build a, a so little design to add it to our design system rather than make it one-off values. And I've added another one there for with arrow, which I've got a, a, an after selector on. So yeah, this, this is the other way of extending Tailwind by just adding these classes in Yeah, And then adding this in that responsive will generate the responsive variants for this as well. Uh, let's see, post CSS, that's the same as what we saw on the slide. Uh, yeah, let's have a look at um, so in the index file itself. So yeah, so what we've seen is, is all the CSS 
the actual CSS files, uh, everything else is generated by adding these classes. So this is going to set a minimum height of the container to be the size of the screen. Uh, we're going to set the default font, we're going to set the default size, and set the background color to be this, this gray color. Uh, set some top and bottom part padding, so padding y-axis of top and bottom. Uh, set a black background on this one. We're going to set a, a slightly different padding, whether it's on a medium screen. And you know, that's one thing I like about Tailwind here is it's very easy to look at something and know exactly how, what it does and how it looks just just reading this. And yeah, I think like my first reaction, I'm sure everybody's is, is, is just look at it and go look at all these classes everywhere. But yeah, like, you know, try using it. And after like 10 minutes, it's, it's really not much of a, a, a thing. Um, this is inheriting the default link style, but I'm overriding it, adding some additional classes on here. It's fine. I'm, I'm personally fine with a little bit of repetition on these, which, um, yeah, you, I could extract those other classes as well if I wanted to. Um, they I'm using the, these dark filtering. So I'm saying on, on dark mode, uh, apply this in this invert. I'm putting in um, some files, Let's see if there's anything else that's particularly worth mentioning. Mentioning. Um, using some CSS grid in here. So yeah, applying a, a grid, one column grid on mobile and the three column grid on medium screen uh, with a gap of 10. So I, I realize I haven't actually explained this at all. So um, the scale typically works as, as four is one rem and then everything else is proportional. So eight is double four, so eight is two rem. And then yeah, 16 is double eight. So it's all proportional based on that, you know, full, full tailwind units being one rem. And then here I'm using space utility to say space out the children on a vertical axis by 16. So that's four, eight, 12, so it's four rem. It does that automatically. Um, yeah, and again, this is all sort of responsive because we're you know, using media. Again, it's sort of encouraging a, a mobile first sort of best practice workflow, I guess, by the way it generates everything by minimum width. Uh, there's a custom with arrow class in here. Um, yeah, this is, this is all on GitHub as well. So some of my other ones, or you can take a look at it. Yeah, so sort of rebuilding symphony.alpadaves.uk. Um, and yeah, if I just toggle this quickly, you should see it actually change. So. Yeah, there's our, there's our dark mode in effect. Um, if I just refresh this one, yeah, again, they're, they're not, it's, it's not a perfect clone, but it's it's pretty close. You know, I think for you know, a couple of hours work, I think it was definitely, um, it was pretty good. Um, okay, so a couple of useful links here. So yeah, tailwindcss.com is, is the main, documentation website. They've got a lot of examples. Um, there's a, a screencast series Adam's been still working on, the creator. Um, they're definitely worth taking a look at as well. Um, it's all free and open source for the, the CSS framework side of things. Um, Tailwind UI is a paid uh, library of components. So uh, you can purchase that as a one-time thing and they give you uh, a whole library of reusable components that you can then just copy and paste the markup from uh, and then make this made, you know, customized as you need to for your project. Um, Built with Tailwind is a, a community brand site where people just submit their projects and this little sort of showcase gallery of them. Uh, Adam does streams on YouTube occasionally quite regularly, uh, working on Tailwind itself, but also sort of rebuilding projects like I did with the Symphony one, he's rebuilt you know, quite a few of these. It's great to see how you know the creative project will will use it. Uh, there's, there's a Drupal.org link here. So it's a, a starter kit theme that because I was redoing this on on various um, personal and, and freelance projects. So I thought I'd bundle this up into a theme that we can reuse. Um, so it's there. Um, there's a Drupal 7 and a Drupal 8 and a Drupal 9 version. Um, so it's again it, you can sort of use it and then rename it and customize it as, as you want. Uh, I've written some blog posts and all my sort of GitHub repos are all at this Tailwind repos link as well. Uh, and now we have a, a Tailwind CSS channel on the Drupal Slack as well that, um, that was set up quite recently. So we've got a, a little sort of sub community of Drupal or Tailwind people uh, going on in there. So come and hang out with 
fact here when people can ask some questions there as well, if you think of any after the fact. Um, yeah, otherwise, if you've got some questions now, um, quite happy to answer some questions now or feel free to send me some afterwards. Paul, I bet you've got some questions. So is there a big library of free patterns for this then? Uh, so there is, so there's Tailwind UI, which is the paid one. Um, there was one that was, I think it was like tailwindcomponents.com, which was like the community um, sort of version of it before Tailwind UI was a thing. So yeah, there's some in here, but these are all again community sort of submitted and I don't know how, if they're moderated or approved or anything. Um, so these, these are quite good for examples, um, but the, the Tailwind UI ones, these ones are pretty awesome. But yeah, you do have to pay for these, but they are like a one-time one -time thing. Um, yeah, but then a lot of the time as well, what I do quite like doing is just looking at websites and just doing like view source and just source diving them. And because yeah, most of the time it's using the same sort of class, classes underneath yeah you can sort of see you know what they've done with it or something else um there is a github page uh, which i'll post a link for in a moment so i've got it on my bookmarks which has oh, got yeah. loads and loads of tailwind resources it's a flexible awesome tailwind, yes, yes. um is that the one you do you know this the one. you know it's off your head did this one awesome tailwind uh, css keep scrolling down Keep going, keep going. Yeah, that's the one. Um, yeah. And the, there's a number of component libraries there as well, free of charge and sort of uh, upload your components. There's loads to go out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good good resource as well. So people checking this out. This is good as well, actually. I saw this recently, tailwind.run. So you get this little sort of, um, is this one? Is this is this default was? It's when I was playing with it. But yeah, it's, a, it's like a code pen with Tailwind, Tailwind built into it already, which is fine. Yeah. But then you can also then, yeah, here's a config file and you can add more stuff in. So if you want to add the custom forms plugin, you can do that and it will rerun it and everything. This is, this is quite cool. You can see what it would generate and what your actual CSS looks like and compiled version. Because, yeah, this is like, you know, yeah, a lot of CSS <laughs> by default. Then the purge version is um, yeah, also a lot less. So this is this is quite cool. A bit more intelligent as well. I don't know who maintains this, but it's it's pretty awesome. There's some really good links on that page. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah, I'm just you know, the thing I didn't sort of be put on them on this one, but if I load up this. Um... Do, 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 do. Network. Let's do a quick reload and see if I can find. Yeah, so the actual CSS for this is 3K. Yeah, so now it's purged everything. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't get, like, it does generate a lot by default, as, as we've seen, but like, once it's gone through a purge, it's only going to keep you know, what it actually needs. So the amount of comp compality as you get is going to be usually a lot less than you would get even by writing it yourself and, and doing the per component or per module based styling because you don't have that duplication because you're just reusing the same classes all the time. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the Drupal theme that you've, <clears throat> you put, you're working on? Um, I've just installed it and it's at, at first installation it's, it's kind of unstyled. Is that the idea that it's a a blank canvas or do I need to initiate something um, to comp do an initial compilation you know so things like pages and forms are, are better styled than just um, blank canvas I guess. Yeah it, it's meant to be pretty blank like I, d I didn't want to go making too many assumptions for anybody but the, there should be at least some like I, I do compile there, there is a compiled version in there, like purely there for testing, put for testing or demo purposes, like for this. So you can just load it up on simply test me and see it actually working, hopefully. Um, so yeah, I do need to go in and update that to be the latest version, to be like 1.7.2, I think is the newest one now. Um, so yeah, I've not added too much in there intentionally. 
Um, I've just made an issue to add some default tab styling because there's no tab styling in it now by default. And I think I've added some form styling. Oh, I, I could just look exactly what's in there, couldn't I? That would be a good idea. Um, but yeah, I, I have kept it quite minimal. So the idea is that you know people will just download it and then rename parts of it and add in what they want to add in. So I've added some default styling for input, inputs and things, but yeah, I've definitely kept it minimal um, intentionally. Um, let's see. I think I'd like to see something that's kind of semi-styled, you know, um, mm -hmm. just not necessarily an advanced starting point, but, um, you know, just, just, you know, like if you were to install uh, Bootstrap 3, for example, with Drupal, the, the original Bootstrap thing, you got some really basic styling, but it just gives you a little bit of a, a teaser, something to give you a, a feel for what you might be able to expect. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I guess it's knowing where to draw that line, I guess, isn't it? I don't want yeah, to absolutely, make yeah. too many yeah. assumptions, everybody. Um, but yeah, definitely put in here for the, some tab styling. But if there's any, any but you could just include it as a sub module, couldn't you? And then you could have like just like two sub modules so you can show two different ways you could style the site. It really kind of something that most themes don't do with the, I don't know why they don't do. Yeah. Let's see, this is a little bit of an old video now, but let's see, this this should give some idea of what it sort of looks like out of the box. And yeah, that's been, that's been an interesting thing. Like, so I've, I've done it and I've sort of gone myself between, is it like a, a starter kit or is it like a base theme? And uh, I think it said just said there was like 60 sites using it or something, but yeah, the way I've been using it recently is, is yeah, that's what we're getting is, um, yeah, you sort of download it and then rename it and then it's yours. I don't see there's much benefit to it being a base theme as such. So I'm still sort of having debates around that internally. And in fact, there's some code I can remove if I, if it wasn't be considered to be a base theme at all. Like I still think it's fine for like demos and, um, you know, or, or a starter kit, but yeah, I'm not sure what the benefit is because you're going to want to start configuring the Tailwind instance yourself anyway, so then you have to copy config files into your theme. So having it in a, an apparent theme doesn't seem to make much sense, but. I, I um, think just a starting point, you know, reasonably styled forms, tabs. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that I'm increasingly looking at when I'm reviewing a theme is, um, has it got stuff like pre-packaged JavaScript so that drop-down menus work? Um, has it got built-in hamburger menus for uh, you know, a mobile view of the site? Just so that I don't have to go looking around a load of contrib or, or you know, um, yeah. looking for extras to make it complete, really. Well, yeah. it's good that you say that, but in D9, they'll be able to compile all that stuff in now because themes can now require modules. So you'll be able to define like, use the, the hamburger project with your theme and then provide a theme override. This should be all sorts of good stuff coming down with themes in future if people release them. But not many people publish themes. Not many people? Publish themes. Oh, that's true, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's it's the only theme I so, yeah, I mean I maintain quite a few modules and things, but it's the only theme that I try maintaining. So no, it is slightly different. So I'm still admittedly trying to figure out, you know, best practice for maintaining this theme. Do you want to co maintain mine, Oliver? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, so this is what I'm doing. Um yeah, if anybody's got ideas, you know, stuff you want to add, you can Feel free to make the issues and always have it have patches and issues created. And I can have a look. Um, there's a couple more in, in here now, so it's nice to see. Um, yeah, the little sort of community and and in in the Slack channel as well. There's quite there's I don't know, maybe about twenty people also in there now. In there now, but there's so many re very recently been added. So it's nice to see, you know, people in there. And I uh, know not just people who use the, the starter kit as well. You know, the Celebrate Drupal 9 thing is done with Tailwind um, you know, on its own. But, you know, Dan Dan is in that channel as well. So we can sort of bounce ideas off each other. I think this utility CSS is a great approach, really. Um, in, in a lot of ways, Drupal, um, 
lends itself to it in terms of, well, just look at views, for example. You know, if, you, if you're building a view with fields, um, the, the, you know, views has just got baked in ways of you being able to drop in um, CSS classes. Um, and likewise, through contrib, you've got things like block class or field formatter class, which again, just allow you to drop in these um, utility um, snippets. And, and, you know, with those, you, you know, if you've got a full, ut a full library to start with, you're kind of halfway there. I haven't built a site with it yet. What, what worries me a little bit, um, I, I, I don't really like diving into templates. Um, I don't know any twig. I don't know any code, frankly. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I certainly don't know any of the, the more advanced stuff about twig, the programmatical stuff. And about as much as I do when I'm in a template is maybe just changing the uh, the order that something might load in. So mm -hmm. I think I think a question might be for me: if I was to use Tailwind, would I? Where would I be spending my time? Would I be spending my time in Twig files, or would I be making the most of what Drupal and Contrib can give me in terms of being able to just drop classes into stuff, or would I be using a, a kind of a SAS less type approach, approach and uh, using your apply? Is it a directive you said or? Um, yeah, well, I think directive is the, is the way that you... Where would you be spending your time? Would I just be living in Twig files? That doesn't appeal. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess if you were doing... At least when you're build, building a static page like that Symphony one, everything's pretty much done in the in the template. And typically, I think that's sort of the way they intended to be used. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, there are definitely people just who are just, just reapplying... I'm quite happy with that. Um, yeah. Maybe if you're using Display Suite, you might be able to use Tailwind. Yeah, sure, again, mm. yeah. Yeah, that's another way to all, or you say block class or something is another one. Um, but yeah, there's definitely people who, you know, sort of use Tailwind, at least to begin with, and just add apply everything. And they, so they're still using sort of BEM style classes or, and there are parts of Drupal that are a bit tricky to get to. And so then I uh, do rely on that apply for that in some places. But then yeah, usually then they sort of start doing it that way and then typically then start going more towards the template type approach. Um, that's what I've seen. But then, yeah, like things like display suite and, and block class and everything should work as long as then um, assuming you're exporting your config into files and YAML and you're then including that in the purge config. So then it knows to, you know, not purge those classes out, which is why. Oh, right. That's, that's there's a good answer scheme. What was, it, what was it involved there then? Um, so yeah, just for example, so if I look at maybe like my site, even, you know, this is done with Tailwind and stuff, and there are a couple of classes in like views and things, but all I've done is inside the Tailwind config file is just included, like this line is pretty much going to be a given, right? And you look for any twig files, any HTML files, and find classes inside there. But yeah, I'm just including this. Like this line here, so yeah, include any classes within config. So if I've added a class into a view, which I think I've done in a couple of places, then yeah, that'll get picked up here. Uh, and I'm not, I'd rather have a couple of false positives and have a couple of classes, uh, maybe like if something does match by coincidence, I'd rather have, you know, a couple of additional classes that aren't used inside my purged CSS than having like the full, the full version. And, and the full version does, even though it's like, you know, like, 1.6 meg, whatever it was, or 2 meg to, by default, it does um, compress really. So, like, that's not as much as it comes through, like, over the wire. But yeah, it's definitely but definitely worth um, purging as long as you get that right. And that's something I've been, I was trying to sort of figure out in the, in the starter kit a lot of the time, <laughs> like, you know, what's the best way of purging? But again, it's, um, you know, just give them the, give, give a default, and then people can add more stuff based on their, on their particular use case. Oliver, do you have to hand for a site that you've built with Tailwind? Do you have to have, have to hand a page.html.twig file that you could show us? Um, yeah, I guess there should be some some even in this one. Um, do I have one? Yeah, I've got a page right here. 
So yeah, there's just a couple of sort of classes at the top here. So the the D7 version, everything's prefixed with TW dash, but the D8 one, if I'm using, I think using classy or the stable base theme, I've not hit any clash clashes with it. I've been trying it for quite a while on um, a couple of sites and not had this problem, not had any problems. So the D8 ones are, are not prefixed by default. So yeah, just in this case, just adding yeah some classes on on some wrappers and things. So very similar to what we to what we saw um, in the other ones. And yeah, a little bit of Alpine JS in there as well. So well, this is interesting. Do you think it's realistic to perhaps invest some time into getting your you know your your, your basic page container sorted out with the you know, the container classes and so on. I see you've got some flex in there and what have you. And then doing the rest with either display suite or, or views or whatever, and, and, and maybe not even doing any CSS at all, apart from maybe some color overrides or whatever. Could that be done? Is that a realistic thing? Um. Yeah, I guess. I mean, that's, that's one of the nice things about it. It's just really customizable. You can sort of use it how you want to use it really like if you want to do the display suite way mostly then yeah i'm sure that would that would work as well like i've got a couple of a couple of components in here that i'm using so like the container um i think was the one i was going for here yeah i've just got a container i've added you know width full and the maximum width so i'm not using tailwinds container in here at all i'm using this custom container mm. it's built out of, out of these these ones um and yeah, I've got a little bit called wrap. So yeah, in some places I am extracting some some classes, but not as my sort of go-to approach really. But yeah, you can it's so sort of, yeah, use it in various different ways. Yeah, like in here, just yeah, disable disable the default container and just re implement it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could do it mostly the template way, or you could yeah apply everything, or this, the display yeah. to it, I'm sure would be an interesting one as well to try. Mm. Needs a demo distribution, doesn't it? <laughs> With alternative approaches to learn from. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, as long as it's something that, you know, I'm always happy to have you know, people create issues with suggestions and, and if it's something patches and if it's something I want to maintain, then I'll add it. But um, yeah, the maintenance is the problem, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it is meant to be like a demo slash starter kit. Start theme. It's, it's not meant to be a, a fully thing, but yeah, you say it might be worth building about a, a bit more, maybe. But yeah, what I don't really want to do is then people to then start and then start having to undo everything. It's sort of meant to be more of a, a sort of starting point, really, than anything else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you should say that. I just happened to think of uh, uh, ran one of those projects Randy used to spend a lot of time with the examples project. Just thinking mm -hmm. if there was like an examples for themers or something like that, something that a more designy based thing than programmically based. You know, I'm just rambling. <laughs> it's a great idea, though. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Interesting I, idea. I nominate you, Paul. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're Seconded. <laughs> yeah, it's on the internet now. You got it. <laughs> As I was just saying in the chat, actually, I think the Tailwind UI website is um, a really good resource just for sort of seeing how it, it can all be put together. Uh, I see a lot yeah. of potential with that, I really do. Yeah, definitely. And that's the, again, the good thing about the nice thing about those is they are sort of starter kits again. You know, you meant to, oh, I quite like the look of, you know, there's Navbar or wherever it is. and here's all the markup that it needs and you pretty much click a button and copy paste it and then it's yours then to you know, change how you want to change it. Yeah. So yeah, all just, you know, reference an example, as you said. Well, this is one of the points I was, you know, when I asked the JavaScript question, I don't think the Tailwind UI is shipping with any JavaScript. They're, they're likewise, in mm -hmm. a way, they're leaving it um, as a blank canvas so that people can either put their own JavaScript in or use some React or some Vue or whatever. But for somebody like myself that doesn't code, that, that's, that's not really that helpful. I, I would just 
like to sort of say, you know, this will make a Tailwind drop down menu work. This will make a, a Tailwind mm -hmm. uh, hamburger menu work and, and just be able to, just for it to, to be there. You know, I don't want to, Oh, I don't know. It's coded. Never mind. <laughs> they, they've had, yeah. There's been some discussions around that. Like they, they did ship it with Alpine JS at the yeah. beginning, which was, you know, I like quite like Alpine for these little things. But yeah, I think again, they didn't really mean for it to be production ready JavaScript, and I think people were treating it as such. And then also, you know, people like, oh, if I want to do this in React, I need to then undo all the the all the the Alpine stuff. Well, so, I can see that was an issue. Um, yeah, some, so, some kind of toolkit that's available if you want to use it ready-made to go mm. yeah although they've just hired like people as well so um, yeah, I'm i think yeah. part of what the brad's job is is to you know build these sort of components and they've talked about having a, a v version and a react version and maybe an alpine version and the plain version of each one so that'd be that would be pretty cool mm. um, i know they're doing um, like adding the prefix as well. Like if, you, if you are using a prefix and you want to use a Tailwind UI, you can then add the prefix before you copy it, which is lovely, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah it's, it's interesting times, yeah. So, you know, it's, they've made a lot of money from Tailwind UI and other things. So, yeah, they've taken on these staff members. So, um, like, um, yeah, interesting stuff coming down the pipe, I think. Mm, no, I agree. I agree. I think it's uh, watch this space. I think it's going to be an important sort of thing, really. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting to get as well, like how like different people, I like say Bootstrap have started doing some utilities like P4 and whatever as well. But there's another one called Tachyons, which is similar. But um, like, you know, these guys came to this same realization, totally different perspectives. You know, tachyons is we want to make something that's really performant and how can we make you know they, but they use like db for display block and things like that right so they've gone to it from a perspective of they want to make things as performant as possible whereas adam's saying was you just want to be able to reuse things across different projects and found that the things he was copying and pasting was with the really small utility classes like display block so like they've sort of gone from this from totally different direct different starting points and come up with the same result which is, is quite interesting it seems to be the way things are sort of going mm. yeah well, it's excellent. That's excellent it is very similar to to pattern labs like we create classes with styles and then we apply them to things so the methodology is the same yeah for sure yeah yeah, yeah de definitely for me i've been using it like since like it started off as Adam was doing a, a PHP project and then someone said, everyone was saying, oh, what's the CSS framework you're using? And you know, so I decided, before you even think about open sourcing it, I started looking at Tachyons and used that for a little while and then went to Tailwind was it was released. But like, yeah, I, I would only have, like I was writing CSS today, like normal CSS and it felt so strange now. <laughs> so I, I'd much rather do this approach if I can. Yeah just like the readability of it in a, in a file, but also I know what I'm changing only affects this thing. You know, I'm not going to worry about breaking something somewhere else. So it's, um, and I've seen that a lot of other people saying that as well. You know, it's now they've started doing it. You, you get that initial reaction of, ah, look at all those classes. <laughs> you get over that. And then once you actually restart using it, you pick up you know, so much speed from, from doing it. It's sort of, um, it's hard to go back. Did you find it took a long time to, just learn it, really. I mean, there's, uh, it's um, not much, is it? There's no, not at all. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think so. I think, again, I think that people have, like, looking at the scale, like I said, four is one rem, like, but there's no five. At least there wasn't at the beginning. So, that, like, so everyone go, oh, why, is there, why isn't there a five? And then once you sort of understand that it's proportional and, you know, there's a lot more of the smaller values, not less of the bigger values for, for reasons, you know, that makes sense. Um, but like for me, yeah, the methodology, like a lot, I learned a lot about like all the CSS grid stuff I've done, I've done with Tailwind. So I've been learning about that from using Tailwind. And like other people have said the same about Flexbox. You know, they really learned about Flexbox from using Tailwind and from its examples, which is you know, another nice sort of side effect. Mm -hmm. and for the most part, they are really sort of obvious, one of a better word. You know, I want something that's float left. So the, I'll guess the class is called float left, which it is. You know, it's um, 
yeah, it's, it's not that sort of hard to lose. It wasn't for me anyway. And, and the docs are awesome. Um, there's, there's a very yeah. comprehensive set of doc, documentation around it um, with examples and responsive versions and, and everything. Excellent. Okay, well, that's uh, thanks for the talk. Very, uh, no thanks for having me back again. Uh, are there any more Tailwind questions just out of interest? Just uh, any, any DDEV questions? Since we've got the man here, the expert. <laughs> Has anyone ever done a DDEV container linked directly to a VPN? Um, are you saying what where's the container where's where's the ddev project where's the vpn what what kind of connection are you talking about yeah so like say i fire up a ddev container and it loads an image which has a vpn i can turn off so then i'm just like ddev ssh into the container and then just run a command and turn on the vpn or is that two container inception I'm still, I'm still not, I'm still not following. Uh, people have, people have put DDEV on a different machine so that they can use a fast Linux machine. They have used VPN from within a container, but <laughs> I'm still right. not. Yeah, that, that would be it then. It'd be, it'd be using a, a VPN from within the container. Is that documented somewhere? But it, 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 well, I mean, of course, there's many, many different ways to do VPN, but if the VPN is running on the host, then it'll just be routed as is. So there's no, there's no issue. If, um, if the VPN is only in, to be inside the container, then that's just a matter of installing the VPN inside the container if that's what's needed. But most people run the VPN on the host. A lot of people run into this with work situations, of course. They, they need to access a, a private composer repo or something that can only go through a VPN. Um, and so they, so they have to do that. And so they have the VPN on the host and the routing from within the container just works. I mean, assuming that you don't have some firewall activity somewhere, but am I still on, am I on the right subject? Yeah, you're on the right track. Well, basically the use case is that we have loads of clients and several of them are really picky and have their own special VPN setups. So if I could make some scripts so that each specific site had specific VPN configurations and I could connect to them. Yeah, I know David, I'm probably yeah. dreaming, but hey. No, knowing the client, you'll need it. Um, <laughs> No, it, it, it's, it's, they are very picky and like UAT environments don't have internet connection uh, outbound. You know, it, it's, it's really tough, uh, really tight VPN control. Um, right, right down to we have to use HTTPS to GitHub pull. And we have to hope that the right GitLab, uh, GitHub mirror is up because they've allowed to a couple of IPs only. Yeah, this is why scripting it would be a good idea. Mm. But um, yeah, I was just curious. I figured someone would be insane enough to try it at some point. Randy, can you tell us um, uh, maybe a quick commercial break? Tell us a little bit more. Tell us a little bit more about um, uh, the hosting service that you're launching for DDEV. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so DDEV Live is the hosting service, and it's a it is a command line driven uh, thing, kind of like DDEV Local where you can uh, launch a site or, or do all those things that you do from the command line. It's Git, Git driven. So when you, push, when you push a commit, that gets deployed. Um, and uh, we, have, uh, we have an easy way to try it out. I think there's a 10 day free trial or something like that. Um, and we'd love to, love to have you try it out. Uh, go to ddev.com and you'll see the live link there. 
and it, it'll onboard you. And uh, we've got a DDEV live channel and Drupal Slack and uh, the, the support on the, uh, on the DDEV live page is, is great too. The, the, uh, it just sends an email and he's really responsive getting back on that. But um, we'd love to have you try it out. It looks quite an affordable option compared with a lot of uh, specialist Drupal hosting um, companies. I think I think it's going to be good. Uh, the, you know the the current I think the current price is fifteen dollars a month or something like that, and all they actually have rolled out is like the one site, um, not huge site option, and uh, so that's a that's a good price. I think the other stuff they're they're still trying to figure out. You know, like how do we make how do we make this how do we make money on this? You know, how much do we have to spend for what? All the things that people have to figure out. Sure. Interesting. Okay. Is there any, um, I mentioned um, at the beginning, just floating some ideas. Is it, is it time to get together and have a pint in the pub yet? Are you buying? <laughs> Well, no, he's just bought Tailwind UI, so he's got no money left for the rest of the century. <laughs> it's a waste of money. He should get DDEV live. First, first, first round is on me, then. How's that sound? <laughs> I can understand what? some people might have reservations about it. I mean, I, I, I always find um, you learn as much and you, you get as much out of any meetup, just getting face-to-face -face with people and having a bit of a chat and a drink uh, but I think the zoom things worked out really well and I'd like to keep that going um, just wondered what other people felt really yeah keep keep the zoom thing going because I mean Leeds is doable but it's quite a way for me sure. um, and we've we've not got a local anymore I shut it down a couple of years ago because it was me the other co-organizer and the guy who let us into the building that you're in Cambridge up. right David is that right yeah, I'm Cambridge well near enough yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about yeah. poor Randy. He's got to fly over from. Yeah, he's. Um... <laughs> it's an expensive <laughs> beer trip, isn't it? <laughs> oh, you know. Yeah, but it's good beer. Let's be honest. It's it's, it's proper bitter. <laughs> All right, I'll turn the recording off now, and then people can talk about whatever. So. <laughs>